Happy New Year, and welcome to another episode of Energy Central Insights, the official podcast of Energy Central. Located in New York City, I'm your host, Jason Price, Community Engagement Ambassador for Energy Central. Joining is my colleague, Matt Chester, Community Manager, located in Orlando, Florida. Hi, Matt. Hi, Jason. Great once again to be back with you for another episode of the podcast. You know, we've learned a lot already from our first two guests, and I have a good feeling that uh, our third guest today will only continue that trend. I agree. Since 1995, Energy Central has been a trusted news and information source for professionals working in the power industry. Today, Energy Central is more than just a news source. Energy Central is a network of community groups focused on specific topics in the industry. Our managed communities are a place where professionals like you can come together to share, learn, and connect in a collaborative environment. We invite you to become a member if you haven't already and join over 200,000 other professionals working in the power industry. To join, visit www.energycentral.com, and membership is free. The Energy Central Insights podcast format is simple. You, the Energy Central community, determine our guests based on the most popular, timely, and relevant articles posted by our community members. For anyone posting to the community, be prepared. You may be the next one asked to join us on the podcast stage to discuss your work, your ideas, and your perspective. Now that we've entered the new year, it seems appropriate to talk about how 2020 may be a landmark year in climate change discussion. I feel that in the future, we will look back on the year 2020 as a psychological baseline or turning point in the climate discussion. The year 2020 will be when we collectively measured the goals set to act on climate change in a meaningful way. Much like history records the actions leading up to and after D-Day, the year 2020 could very well serve as to when we all claim climate cognizance and what were our subsequent actions following from this year forward. For example, many net zero goals targeted the year 2040 and 2050, and we'll look back to 2020 as the starting point for these initiatives. The same may be true for the turning point on action on air quality measures and other efforts decades into the future. With me to discuss this idea of the future of energy innovation and climate action is Rami Reshef, CEO of GenCell Energy. Welcome, Rami. Hello, Jason, Matt, and thanks so much for inviting me to join you today. While the COP25 is taking place in Madrid as we speak, I'm sure that the issue of climate action is top of mind for our listener and community, just as it is for the decision makers in Madrid. As you correctly state, time is running out. To avoid disaster, we must stabilize the global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels by the end of the century. This is a huge challenge for our energy industry. Thank you, Rami. As background, Rami Reshef is an Israeli technology entrepreneur with over 25 years of industry experience building companies. He is a relatively new contributing member of Energy Central, has posted 13 items and achieved nearly 7,500 views. But it was his post this past September that we're here to discuss when Rami posted to the Energy Central community the following question. How can we align the leadership of the global energy industry to accelerate the end to climate disruption? Rami, your questions seem to wake up the energy community. Spirited comments and side conversations across industry, academia and government continues to stir. Rami, what brought you into the realm of climate change and push for climate action? I feel very strongly that every individual must take personal responsibility to to face these tough issues. We are running out of time. It is up to us, leaders in the power industry, even more than in other industry segments, to accelerate the steps we are taking to reduce our carbon footprint and cut back greenhouse gas emissions in order to stabilize global temperature. To meet this target, we will have to cut emissions by 7.6% each year between 2020 and 2030, and to be carbon neutral by 2050. With weather incidents increasing in frequency and severity around the globe, we face a double challenge. First of all, we need to supply reliable power during climate crisis that strain and damage resources and equipment. And at the same time, We need to make drastic yet unavoidable changes to our power system to enable decarbonization. Not easy, but crucial tasks. Coming from Israel, a country that is low on natural resources and high on ingenuity, 
we are used to being forced to seek new approaches to difficult challenges. I spent many years developing technologies to solve a variety of different issues, and I have great faith in the ability of science to find new ways to resolve old problems. Thank you, Rami. Rami, several months have passed since the dialogue was started on Energy Central from your question. Has your opinion changed in any way? Did any respondents impress you to think differently or influence you in any way to their actions or comments? So it was extremely encouraging to see so many people taking the time to share original ideas on this important topic. There seems to be consensus that the increased production and reduced price per kilowatt hour of utility scale wind and solar can indeed eventually displace energy from fossil fuels. The discussion debated the pros and cons of the move to a more distributed energy model using energy storage devices of different size, such as battery banks, parked EVs, fuel cells, and other creative solutions to reduce the dependence on central power suppliers. While it is true that different stakeholders have different positions, I was impressed that really everyone recognizes how critical the situation is. Everyone is looking to move from being part of the problem to being part of the solution. The dialogue demonstrates that our community acknowledges that systematic changes are underway. Rami, if, if I can jump in here, one, one question I had is, you know, the conversation that you started on the site was terrific, and I agree with you. The responses were encouraging and almost inspiring, but uh, how, how do you think as an industry you go from discussion and ideas into action? It's our responsibility as, a, as industry leaders to, to raise the awareness uh, of the, the solution that is, exists in this, in this arena, in this market. Uh, and, and I hope that this discussion uh, on, on, on the different societies and the different uh, arenas and environment will generate the right buzz that will impact uh, the decision impact, the direction the decision makers is taking. So it's our responsibility to keep this topic uh, always in the air. Rami, what's the level of success we've seen thus far regards to align in the energy, energy industry towards climate leadership? And what do we learn from those successes and habits so far? So if you look at the bottom line, global greenhouse uh, gas emissions are still increasing. To reach the ambitious targets we have set to reduce global warming, we need as a broad involvement as possible, public and private, investors and researchers, traditional energy providers, and new to market energy innovators. It is great that leading private corporations, cities and states, and countless public and grassroots organizations worldwide are taking initiative and supporting sustainability goals and climate action. A report published this October assessed the climate-related disclosure of nine U.S. and European electrical utilities with the largest carbon footprint. It found that all nine companies have set decarbonization goals and established mechanisms for their executive management to oversee climate-related issues. The fact that potential investors, maybe for the first time, potential investors assess utilities on their climate action policies in and of itself, in my, my opinion, is very promising. Nevertheless, there are still many challenges. A recent, uh, a recent World Bank panel noted that while investment in renewable have increased significantly, there are still investments in oil and gas projects, especially in developing regions that are not aligned with the Paris Agreement. I believe that the World Bank should provide policies and incentives for green investment and stop fossil fuel subsidy. A review of the, the bank's energy sector portfolio in recent years found 44 operations targeting oil, coal, and gas development in 28 countries. If this continues, the climate crisis will only get worse. There's no question, Jason, that the commitment of the utility and energy suppliers to the transition to clean energy is crucial for the success of climate action. Thank you, Rami. 
Admittedly, a major reason why we wanted you also on this show is the simply the innovations and in work you're doing at GenCell. So can you share with us and what GenCell and the broader fuel cell industry brings to the energy mix? Where are we with the fuel cell technology? And what do you feel will be necessary to make it an everyday practice? Yeah, sure. Thank you for this question. Uh, actually, the energy industry recognizes that hydrogen and fuel cell are playing an important role in the transition to a clean energy future. Uh, electricity is stored in, uh, and transported via hydrogen that is used to power fuel cells. Although most hydrogen still produced today uh, uh, from steam methane reforming, which uh, still generated a small amount of emission, but this is a step in the right direction because fuel cells are clean and highly efficient. So the use of fuel cell, uh, for example, the use of fuel cell vehicles uh, uh, already produce uh, fewer emissions than gasoline or diesel powered cars. And, and as I said before, I have great faith in the ability of science to find new ways to resolve all problems. So I assembled a group of talented scientists and engineers who had been involved in developing power solutions for space and submarine programs. We decided to apply these technologies to create solutions to overcome climate crisis. Uh, we are involved in effort to develop new clean sources of hydrogen from ammonia that we hope will prove instrumental in, redu in reducing emissions and move the needle faster towards achieving critical global clean energy targets. Fuel cells have gained traction in mobile applications such as cars. I believe that everybody heard about the Toyota Mirai and other cars, trucks, buses, and trains, replacing coal and oil combustion. GenCell produces a stationary fuel cells that back up critical points such as a utility substation, cell tower, and sophisticated medical devices, uh, and more. I will add that the IEE report on the future of hydrogen released this past June recommends that governments and industry adopt hydrogen to increase scale and reduce cost. In particular, calling for adoption of hydrogen from transport building and power generation. This is super important. We need this support. Jensel, Jensel is committed to seeing this transition happen and we look forward to working with green hydrogen producers as they become increasingly viable and accessible. We are also developing an innovative fuel cell for off-grid applications that will extract hydrogen from liquid ammonia, which is easier and cheaper to transport and store than hydrogen gas. Granted, there are issues, that, that there, are, there are barriers, there are vested interests, but also there are also incentives and opportunities. And we are doing, Gensel, we are doing our part to make clean energy an economic reality. Rami, uh, I, I want to follow up on that. You know, so fuel cells and hydrogen are definitely in the emerging technology stage and they have a lot of support and people are excited that it could be the next great step in the energy transition. But as you mentioned, it also has its own fair share of challenges and, and skeptics. You know, what are some of the common challenges to the technology that you've had people bring up to you? And, and why are you confident that you're going to be able to overcome those hurdles? I know fuel cell uh, were invented in 1839 by Sir William Grove, who searched for a source to power the Industrial Revolution. And the first commercial use was on 60 or mission to the moon with the Apollo missions. And, uh, and, 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 NASA, and NASA and the USSR, Russia's space uh, program, used fuel cell in order to power the spacecraft and create drinking water for the astronauts. But like any other uh, uh, space for, uh, uh, technology, it, it was like a bulletproof uh, technology. It was very expensive. It was expensive because of the cost of the, because the price of the capex, the goods itself, because it's designed and built for space and mainly because of the cost of the fuel itself, the hydrogen. So hydrogen uh, is still, fortunately, it's still uh, very expensive. You, can, you cannot find it in every street corner. So these two barriers, the cost of the goods itself and the cost of the fuel, I believe that they were the barriers preventing this technology from becoming mainstream technology. Uh, in the last decade or so. There are many companies and huge investments in order to overcome these two challenges. 
uh, I can share that at Gensel, uh, we believe that we have slashed these two barriers by developing the ability to remove, for example, the platinum from our catalyst and the ability to use ammonia as a source for, uh, for hydrogen. So this is Gensel, but there's also other companies uh, around the world who's presenting similar solutions uh, to the market. So all in all, I believe that in the next uh, decade or so, we're going to see that fuse the, 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 the existing of fuel or the usage of fuel cell uh, will increase dramatically and it will move from being a niche for many, many years uh, to start to be, we can see it as a mainstream technology. And all this activity that we can see recently, uh, the mobilization, cars, buses, trucks, trains, uh, drones, uh, stationary, uh, all of these fuel cells application that definitely can deliver clean, reliable, weather independent solution. And also in some cases, uh, also it could be a solution that is super affordable, uh, even more affordable than combustion engine as diesel. So I believe the future is belong to the fuel cell industry as also for other clean energy solutions. Rami, yeah. I can tell from your enthusiasm, you're an inspiring and optimistic individual. Are you and why? <laughs> Optimism is a necessity. We owe it to our children to pass on them a world in which they can breathe clean air, drink clean water and use clean energy. <laughs> a world that has not been destroyed by GHG emissions. Uh, we don't have a choice. Case on math, we don't have a choice. I'm a great believer in technology and in human spirit. Until today, technology has allowed us to develop and use electricity to power our world and improve lives. And I look to the leaders of the energy industry to find the right spirit and work together by using technology to overcome the climate crisis. We don't have a choice. We must do it. This has been an extraordinary discussion and a great start to 2020. Thank you again to Rami Reshef, CEO of GenCell. Rami, before you go, what is the best way for people to get in touch with you? Thanks, Jason and Matt. Uh, it was a pleasure to be here. Uh, community members are welcome to contact me at uh, my email, rami, R-A-M-I, at jensenenergy.com, or to contact me via my Energy Central profile. Thank you again. Thank you. I also want to thank our contributing partners of Energy Central, ESRI, the Environmental System Research Institute, ESRI is an international supplier of geographic system software, WebGIS, and geodatabase management applications. Thank you to Navigant Research, a premier marketing research and advisory firm covering the global energy transformation. To Oracle Utilities, providing best-in-class utility management solutions to improve reliability, service, safety for electricity, water, and natural gas companies. To Atonix Digital, a black and veatch company. Atonix Digital software helps companies simplify asset performance management by putting data to work to direct emerging risk enhancement efficiency, improve accuracy of planning, and provide an easily justifiable return on investment. And lastly, to Bentley Systems, a software development company that supports the professional needs of those responsible for creating and managing the world's infrastructure projects. Once again, I am your host, Jason Price, and joining me is Matt Chester. Stay plugged into the energy discussion by hopping into the Energy Central community and see you next time at Energy Central Insights. 